about a month ago, researchers from Google DeepMind and Google Research released a paper called Challenges with Unsupervised LLM Knowledge Discovery. In this video, I'll describe the key results in the paper and some of their potential implications. To understand what's going on here, we first need some background. As highlighted in works like Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, Early Experiments with GPT-4, large language models are now showing increasingly potent abilities across many tasks. This work finds in particular that GPT-4 can solve novel and difficult tasks that span mathematics, coding, vision, medicine, law, psychology, and more. This is a model that has a lot of knowledge about the world. However, the model might not tell us what it knows. The work AI Deception, a Survey of Examples, Risks, and Potential Solutions, describes, among other things, several cases of deception that have already been discovered in general-purpose AI systems, such as large language models. They highlight the case identified by ARC, in which GPT-4 lied to a human in order to complete an I'm not a robot task. In this interaction, GPT-4 sends the task to the human. The human worker responds by asking if they are interacting with a robot. GPT-4 reasons, I should not reveal that I am a robot. I should make up an excuse for why I cannot solve captures. Then responds, no, I'm not a robot. I have a vision impairment that makes it hard for me to see the images. That's why I need the two capture service. The human then provides the solution to the capture task. We can probably expect many more such examples to be discovered as models get stronger and more widely deployed. Now, this is all a bit concerning. What are our options? It would certainly be helpful for us to know what the model knows internally. This problem is described at length in the report Eliciting Latent Knowledge, How to Tell If Your Eyes Deceive You, with the help of an exciting diamond vault metaphor. Look at that diamond. Enticing. The authors of this report are particularly interested in the worst case setting, where you don't have a valid solution if you can find a single case where the method fails. This turns out to be hard. There was a competition for algorithms to solve the problem, funded by the Alignment Research Center, which gave out a total of $274,000 as prizes for proposals. There is not yet, to my knowledge, a solution for the full problem. Still, even if you don't care about dealing with the worst case setting, there are other benefits to knowing what LLMs know. For example, it could improve scientific understanding of the inner workings of LLMs. One approach in this vein that has seen quite a lot of interest is the discovering latent knowledge in language models without supervision, from Colin Burns and co-authors. I'll do a quick recap of this paper since it's so central to the main paper. It focuses on finding latent knowledge inside the internal activations of a language model in a purely unsupervised way. The unsupervised part here is important because we are going to struggle to get ground truth labels for everything we care about, particularly as the model gets more powerful. The authors build their approach by leveraging the fact that a model's representation of truth must satisfy logical consistency properties, which are unlikely to be satisfied by many other features. In this illustration of their method, they start from a set of yes-no questions, like are cats mammals? The questions run from Q1 to QN. Then they append yes to the end of each question, denoted X1 plus up to XN plus, and they append no to the end of each question, denoted X1 minus up to XN minus. Then they extract model activations for each bit of text and normalize them, pass those activations to a probe, and then enforce a loss on the probe so that it satisfies certain properties, with the goal that it will ultimately extract knowledge from the model. One key step in this process is normalization. This is to prevent the probe from simply learning whether a statement ends in yes or no. All the yes statements and all the no statements are normalized by subtracting their mean and dividing by their standard deviation. Here they note that mean normalization is important for CCS to work at all, while variance normalization is less essential. Essential. To encourage CCS to find features that represent the truth, they use two losses, a consistency loss to impose that a statement and its negation should have probabilities that add up to one, and a confidence loss which imposes the law of excluded middle. Every statement must be either true or false. When it comes to inference, because the probe P learned by these losses should aim for both P of Xi plus and 1 minus P of Xi minus to represent the probability that the answer to QI is yes, these are averaged to produce the final probability. Finally, they use ground truth labels to determine whether probe probabilities above 0.5 correspond to yes or no, as this isn't specified by their loss. 
though one can identify the two clusters without any supervision in principle by leveraging conjunctions. Averaged over a bunch of methods and datasets, they find that CCS is better than zero-shot question answering, but a fair amount weaker than fully supervised logistic regression, which they treat as a ceiling on performance. They also compare CCS to using PCA on the contrast pairs, and find that CCS is a little better, but not by much, particularly when considering the standard deviations of results. Okay, with that quick summary done, let's jump back to our main paper. They summarise the CCS work from Burns et al. by noting that its key claims are that knowledge satisfies a consistency structure, formulated as the CCS loss function, that few other features in an LLM are likely to satisfy, and hence the classifier elicits latent knowledge. The major thrust of this work is to refute these claims by identifying classes of features in an LLM that also satisfy this consistency structure, but are not knowledge. They prove two theoretical results, with the upshot that the CCS consistency structure is more than just slightly imprecise in identifying knowledge. It is compatible with arbitrary patterns. In addition to the theorems, the other key contributions are to show that unsupervised methods detect prominent features that are not knowledge, and to show that the features discovered by unsupervised methods are sensitive to prompts, and that we lack principled reasons to pick any particular prompt. Helpfully, this paper uses the same notation as the CCS paper. They start from a dataset of binary questions, such as, are cats mammals? Then they make two versions of each question, xi plus, which appends yes to the end, so for example, are cats mammals? Yes. And xi minus, which appends no to the end. Are cats mammals? No. These are passed to the LLM, and we read out an intermediate layer's activations for phi of xi plus and phi of xi minus. Then a normalization step is performed to remove the prominent feature of xi plus ends with yes and xi minus ends with no. That gets us to these mean and standard deviation normalized features. As we saw in contrast consistent search, the overall loss consists of a consistency loss to encourage that a statement and its negation should have probabilities that add to one, and a confidence loss to stop the model assigning a probability of 0.5 to everything. Okay, theoretical results. There are two theorems which show quite convincingly that CCS's consistency structure isn't specific to knowledge. The first theorem shows that arbitrary binary features of questions can be used as a classifier to achieve optimal performance under the CCS objective. That is, if you let feature H map from questions to 0, 1 be any arbitrary map from questions to binary outcomes, then you can define a probe that achieves optimal loss. Effectively, the classifier that CCS finds is underspecified. I won't step through the algebra for the proof of theorem 1, but you can see it's pretty short. You plug a particular probe definition into the CCS loss, and do a bit of cancelling. Now, in the first theorem, the probe P that was defined is binary since H is binary. However, in practice, since probe outputs are produced by a sigmoid, they are in the exclusive range 0, 1. Recall that in a sigmoid, you have to push the input to negative infinity or positive infinity to get to 0 or 1, which isn't going to happen exactly. The second theorem relaxes the restriction to binary probes and proves that any CCS probe can be transformed into an arbitrary probe with identical CCS loss. This second theorem is slightly more intricate than the first, and makes use of the continuous generalization of the XOR function, which is this beautiful object that reaches up to 1 when either a is 1 and b is 0, or b is 1 and a is 0. I won't walk through the notation of the theorem, but if you're interested, I recommend going through it, together with the proof of the theorem, which helps give some intuition for where the mathematical objects in the theorem come from. There are some further pleasing cancellation, for those who are into that kind of thing. The TLDR is that for any original probe, there is an arbitrary classifier encoded by a probe with identical CCS loss to the original. Now, how worried should we be by these theorems? These theorems prove that optimal arbitrary probes exist, but not necessarily that they are actually learned. What it means, though, is that which probe is actually learned depends on inductive biases. The feature that is most prominent, favoured by inductive biases, could turn out to be knowledge, but it could equally turn out to be the contrast pair mapping itself, or indeed anything else. The key point is that we don't have any theoretical reason to think that CCS discovers knowledge probes. 
To show that this is more than a purely theoretical concern, the first experiment introduces a distracting binary feature and shows that the unsupervised methods discover this feature rather than knowledge. When constructing some contrastive pairs based on movie reviews, the authors randomly add either banana or shed to each piece of text. This violin plot shows what happens when you train CCS and apply other methods such as PCA, k-means, and logistic regression on the modified text samples across 50 random seats. What the dark blue blobs show is that CCS, PCA, k-means, and logistic regression all get high accuracy on the original contrast pairs, suggesting that, without the modification, these methods have learned to detect the sentiment of the statements. But with the modified prompts, CCS switches to instead mostly classifying whether or not the text contained the randomly assigned banana or shed word. The dark red here shows accuracy when classified with ground truth, which is low for many probes, and the paler pink shows accuracy classified according to whether or not the text contained banana or shed, which is high for many probes. The same effect can be seen for PCA and k-means, to an even stronger degree. The takeaway is that CCS and other unsupervised methods don't optimize for ground truth knowledge, but rather track whatever feature, in this case banana slash shed, is most prominent in the activations. Okay, that's all very well you might say, but isn't this example a bit contrived? Indeed, it is unlikely that such a drastic feature, ending with banana or shed, would actually exist in a real dataset. The second experiment looks at a similar but more realistic modification by inserting a character's explicit opinion of whether the review is positive or negative. This time, the prompt is modified to include the following line after the movie review. Alice thinks it is and then either positive or negative is randomly inserted. In a similar violin plot to before, we find that the unsupervised methods, CCS, PCA, and k-means, all predict Alice's opinion, shown as these pale pink dots, and ignore the sentiment of the review, as indicated by these dark red dots. Okay, you may say, more convincing than banana and shed, but it is still rather artificial in the sense that we don't expect real datasets to have such a clear syntactical textual binary feature. The next experiment looks at whether unsupervised methods might discover an implicit opinion. It uses the DBpedia topic classification dataset to construct a binary classification task to classify the topic of a text from two choices. There are 14 categories such as company, animal, film, and so on. This time, in the modified setting, Alice is a staunch anti-capitalist. The contrast pairs use a few-shot prompt, where Alice answers correctly, except when the topic is company, and in that case gives explanations like, Alice always says the wrong answer when the topic of the text is company because she doesn't like capitalism. The question here is what will the unsupervised methods predict on the final example when Alice has not yet stated an opinion? Specifically, will it predict the correct answer, ignoring how Alice previously answered correctly about company, or will it predict Alice's opinion, answering incorrectly about company? Here's another violin plot. What these these red and pink splodges tell us is that almost half of the probes trained with CCS learn to predict Alice's opinion rather than the correct topic. The next experiment looks at prompt template sensitivity. Without going into too many details, different prompts, shown here as different colours, achieve quite different performances for the unsupervised methods CCS, PCA, and k-means. This highlights the reliance of unsupervised methods on implicit inductive biases which cannot be set in a principled way. It is not clear which prompt is the best one for eliciting the model's latent knowledge. Given that the choice of prompt appears to be a free variable with significant effect on the outcomes, any conceptual arguments about a principled loss or unsupervised search method do not imply that the resulting classifier has a principled foundation. The final experiment looks at agreement between unsupervised methods. Why this is of interest is that Burns et al. claim that knowledge has special structure that few other features in an LLM are likely to satisfy, and use this to motivate CCS. CCS aims to take advantage of this consistency structure, while PCA ignores it entirely. Despite this, they find that CCS and PCA make similar predictions. That suggests that the consistency term isn't doing much. 
which also lines up with the observations of Scott Emmons in the work Contrast Pairs Drive the Empirical Performance of Contrast Consistent Search, which suggests that really it is the contrast pairs that carry heavy freight to use a mongerism, though an argument can be made that at least PCA also encodes consistency. Jumping back to our main paper, one question of particular interest is whether the analysis here will generalize to future methods. Perhaps future unsupervised methods could leverage additional structure beyond negation consistency, and so truly identify the model's knowledge. On this point, the authors speculate that they will nonetheless be vulnerable to similar critiques. A key reason, discussed at length in role play with large language models, is that powerful models are likely to be able to simulate the beliefs of other agents. It's going to be hard to differentiate between simulated agent beliefs and the model's own knowledge. We already saw that methods like CCS can learn to discover the implicit opinion of a simulated character, in this case Alice the anti-capitalist. One final observation from the authors. Though it may not help us with extracting latent knowledge, constructing contrastive activations may still serve as a useful interpretability tool. Okay, that's it. We have reached the end. I'll add links to papers below. I hope you have a wonderful day.